And today we're going to talk about C-spine injuries, but we're not going to talk about the C-spine injuries that you see in the major trauma areas. We're not talking about the intubated patients. We're not talking about the multi-system blunt trauma patient that's going and getting pan scanned. We're talking about the ones that we tend to see in our fast track. Who, who sees these types of patients in their fast track? C-spine, do people come in with C-collars? Uh, the patients that we're going to be talking about and the, that we're going to be focusing on are these sort of patients that don't really have a whole lot of other things, but we're going to try to figure out, A, which of these patients actually need to be immobilized? Is there evidence that they should be immobilized in the first place? Two, if they are immobilized in a C-collar, which of these patients can get cleared? And three, um, which of the patients need to be imaged? So we're going to talk about all those and sort of an evidence-based approach to all that. So let's start with cervical spine immobilization. Who remembers the days where we had these um, hard, the long, long backboards, the hard, long backboards? Who's still seeing those where they're, where they're practicing? Patients are still coming in in those hard backboards. So are those benign, not benign? They're not benign. They cause a lot of pain. Have you ever tried to sit in one of those things? Man, they hurt. The whole point of that is to try to help immobilize the spine and keep you in one position. But if you sit on one of those things, after a few minutes, you're just like, oh, man, this, is, this is, doesn't feel good. Um, people develop pressure ulcers. Um, people that don't have any back pain, you put them any, on, that, on those backboards for about 30 minutes, and sure enough, by the time you're examining them, they're going to be having back pain, which leads to increased imaging. Patients who may not have needed any x-rays or CTs all of a sudden are getting x-rays and CTs. And so the, uh, in 2014, the American College of Surgeons and uh, emergency, the emer uh, emergency physician folks got together and basically said, you know, we don't really need these, uh, the backboards to immobilize. There's not a whole lot of evidence behind it, and it's causing a lot of harm. And now we're asking the same question of C-collars, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding this. Like, do these C-collars actually help prevent the thing that we're hoping they prevent, which is for the patients to not move their spine? or not move their neck. And when you put, if you've ever worn one of these C-collars, you can tell that you can, you can move your neck fairly well. And we've, we actually have some fluoroscopic studies. I know they did one at, uh, at our shop at LA County where they had the residents try these things on and they had them move around. And sure enough, a lot of the residents both were able to be mobile and develop pain that lasted uh, one or two days. Of course, they were putting them on... Uh, uh, the backboards as well, but people were developing pain that lasted one or two days out. So we're not, I'm, not, I'm not here saying that we shouldn't be using C collars at all. I'm just saying that there isn't great evidence for them. I'm not also saying that the absence of evidence doesn't mean that we shouldn't be using them, but there is some significant movement that can occur within these collars. So I think the more important discussion is the, the patients are going to be coming in with cervical collars, and when they do come in, how can we get them cleared as fast as possible? How do we quickly identify who can be cleared and get them out of that C-collar, especially the ones that don't need it? And if we're going to be doing these C-spine um, clearances, really the two gold standard rules, the clinical decision tools that we should all be using are either the nexus criteria that were developed by um, Jerry Hoffman and his folks over at UCLA in a multi-center trial. This is uh, back in the 90s. Or the Canadian C-spine rule that was developed by Ian Steele and, and his group of researchers. If you're familiar with him, he's, he's worked on a lot of decision tools and rules up in Canada. Both of these rules have really good test characteristics. But if we're going to apply them, it's also really, really important to know some of their limitations. So we'll talk about, we'll dissect each of them and unpack each of them individually. Nexus, the cervical x-ray criteria. This was developed not to decide who we should image, but it was to identify patients that were at low enough risk that we could clear and not image. And so we'll go through each of these criteria individually. Who's used Nexus before? Feel comfortable? Okay, so a fair number of people. No posterior midline cervical spine tenderness is the first thing. So palpating along their posterior C-spine. No evidence of intoxication, which can be fairly subjective. You know, uh, clinical sobriety, I have, I have certain uncles that um, they could have a, a lot of drinks and you wouldn't know that they're, <laughs> that they're intoxicated. Um, but is it clinical sobriety or is it the lab number that we're looking at? So really either of those two um, should prevent you from, from clearing. A normal level of alertness, 
so somebody can't be altered. No focal neurologic deficits. It's really important in these patients to do a full motor and sensory exam. And then no painful distracting injuries. Now, what the heck does that mean? Painful distracting injuries. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. So if you meet all of these low-risk criteria, that means that you are able to be cleared and do not need to go on to further imaging. Now let's read some of the fine print. Pain on palpation of the posterior midline neck, fairly um, self-explanatory. Intoxication, um, can, some room for interpretation, but generally I have a, um, a low threshold for not clearing someone while they're still intoxicated, either clinically or by, by lab numbers. Altered, self-explanatory, focal neural deficit, self-explanatory. Let's focus a little bit on painful, distracting injuries. The Nexus investigators admittedly had said that this should be up to um, clinician discretion. And there is a lot of subjectivity to this. You have certain patients that will come in and they'll have a finger sprain and that will be distracting for them. And other people that have, uh, you know, a huge laceration through half their arm and are just sitting there being okay. Uh, so definitely long bone fractures, I think we can all agree, open fractures, large lacerations, things like that. But everything else is up to um, like clinician judgment. So just know that that is a slight limitation and that we don't have a de uh, definitive definition on what that means. The Canadian C-spine rule now, the, what I love about Nexus is its simplicity. There's five criteria, and if those five criteria are met, no, no imaging. The Canadian C-spine rule, you almost need to go plug it into MedCalc or some app or something to make sure you've hit everything right. But the three things that are major criteria for C... So first of all, you need to have some form of neck pain to enter this algorithm. So you have neck pain after a trauma, you enter this, and now if you're either age over, at or over 65, you have a dangerous mechanism which is defined in that box at the bottom right there, um, or there's numbness or neurologic problems in the extremities. All of that necessitates both spinal immobilization and likely uh, you'd be pursuing imaging. Now, um, one of the interesting things is in Nexus, there is no talk about mechanism and there is no, uh, no criteria on age. Subsequent studies have looked at Nexus, particularly in this age group over 65 years old, and they weren't able to find the same sensitivities that the original Nexus investigators had found, which was negative pr uh, predictive value of uh, up to close to 100%. And when you apply the Nexus rules to the greater than 65-year-old population, the sensitivities tend to drop below 90%. So which one should we be using? Should we be using Nexus? Should we be using the Canadian C-spine rules? Should we be using some combination of the two? This is a, uh, a little survey on where uh, people are using Nexus in Canada versus America. And uh, you know, no surprise, Nexus is more widely adopted in America. Canadian C-spine rules are more widely adopted in Canada. My personal practice, my personal practice and based on my, the things that I've seen missed, are I do actually, I use Nexus, and I do incorporate a little bit of the age um, and dangerous mechanism. If I have somebody who got thrown off a horse, torpedoed down with their head first, and they're telling me they don't have neck pain, I'm scanning that person. Um, and some of these people that are age 67, 68, 69, 70, some of these brittle necks, they take a fall, and even if it's ground level, um, I've seen a couple of those missed as well. This is all anecdotal. Uh, and there's no great study that's been done that's shown like the combination of these two rules, right? So I, I think you are pretty well protected if you use Nexus or the Canadian C-spine rules. Just understand the limitations um, and, and consider having a, l a little bit more suspicion in the um, older populations or people with really bad mechanisms, especially like axial loads, diving, diving injuries and whatnot. This is a... Um, C-spine clearance protocol at one of the local uh, hospitals, I believe in Canada, uh, that was inserted in here. You can take a look and see how that compares to your, uh, <clears throat> your spinal pathways. I'm going to focus a little bit on the pediatric C-spine. Can you apply Nexus to the pediatric C-spine? Can you apply the Canadian C-spine rules to pediatrics? So I'll tell you this, the ca Canadian C-spine rules were not, the, the kids were excluded from that study, so Canadian C-spine rules should not be used for kids. Nexus, actually, they enrolled about 34,000 patients in their original um, derivation validation studies, 
And of those 34,000, they did enroll kids, but only about 2% were less than eight years old. And there were almost no patients that were less than two years old. So I would be very weary of applying Nexus to any child less than two years of age, um, possibly in the two-year to eight-year-old range. I think that we can more safely apply Nexus to the eight to nine-year-old and above range. So where does that leave us? A lot of studies have been done looking at sort of risk factors for pediatrics. And what are the things that are positively predictive of a child having a C-spine injury? Do, do children tend to get bad C-spine injuries is the first question. They don't. It's a pretty rare thing for a child to get a C-spine injury. Less than 1% of all C-spine blunt traumas will result in a clinically significant C-spine injury in a child. So there, in and of itself, we know that it's a rare entity, but of course none of us want to miss um, a C-spine injury in a child. And so the P. Karn group and other um, investigators have looked at this, and I'm just going to share with you some of the high-risk features that may prompt you to um, go ahead and image a pediatric C-spine. Neurologic deficits, altered mental status, you're imaging the head anyway, you should probably be imaging the C-spine. Those are all uh, scenarios where the neck should probably be imaged. The other things that have been found to be positively associated are high-speed MVAs, particularly in patients that are unrestrained. These car seats are remarkable. I have yet to see a child that's been properly restrained in a car seat in an MVA that wasn't a crazy MVA, you know, something that was going 80 miles per hour and flew off a cliff um, in a child to have a bad C-spine injury. So a well-restrained pediatric patient in a MVA um, is probably safe unless that MVA was so bad, you know, there were fatalities, people were injected and that kind of thing. The other sort of mechanisms that have been positively associated are axial loading, like diving mechanisms, things like that, or patients that are at high risk, such as Down syndrome, ankylosing spondylitis, those types of patients that have um, baseline pathology in their neck are at higher risk of having um, cervical spine injuries. And then a patient who just has so much pain that they're literally having torticollis. It's hard to imagine not imaging a child's neck that, where their neck is just stuck in one you know, direction and they can't move it at all. So um, again, the studies aren't as well validated in kids. We don't have big nexus, 34,000 patient re registries or um, like we had for Canadian C-spine, uh, but there are some positively predictive things um, for kids to, uh, to uh, prompt you to consider uh, imaging. Now, what type of imaging do we get? for ch children. We can start with x-rays, plain films. Um, you can imagine we're going to be talking about plain films in adults. Plain films in ch children, it's really hard to get the odontoid view. AP lateral fine, but the odontoid, open mouth odontoid view in like a one-year-old is going to be pretty tough. Um, so x-rays are an okay place to start. And then the question becomes, what do you do next if the x-rays are negative? In general, if you have access to an MRI where you're working, that tends to be, and you can get the kids sedated enough or to cooperative enough to go to the MRI, that tends to be a pretty good um, progression of imaging. Get the x-rays. If you're still concerned, you can follow up with MRI. The question becomes, what do we do when, C do, we, do we CT these kids? Do we not CT these kids? And we were just having a couple conversation amongst the group here um, and some, some of you providers about doing limited radiation um, CT scans in kids. Where do kids get the majority of their C-spine uh, injuries? Up high or down low? Up high. The children have large heads, their fulcrum is pretty high, so the majority of C-spine injuries in children are at the C1, C2 level. And so some places, it became in vogue for a little while for certain um, places to image only a limited uh, part of the children's necks, which would be sort of like a limited C1, C2, maybe C3 uh, scan to avoid uh, radiating a child's thyroid. We have stopped doing that when we decide now to get a CT scan of the neck because it does miss some um, lower C-spine injuries. We just end up doing the whole um, CT of the whole C-spine. But for me, if, if I have the option, I try to go X-ray and then to MRI uh, in these children and try to skip the CT altogether for children. CT versus plain cervical X-ray. This is still a issue of debate now amongst adults. 
what test is better for identifying clinically significant C-spine fractures? Obviously, it's the CT. The CT has better resolution. It's going to pick things up better. Um, when you talk to our trauma surgeons over at LA County, they prefer, they, we, they have just stopped asking for cervical spine x-rays. It's CT pretty much most of the time. But is that the right thing? Is it not the right thing? This is a question of much debate. Um, the x-rays are less sensitive. For me, the one time I'm using x-rays, cervical spine x-rays, is somebody that I have a very, very low suspicion, but they happen to um, screen positive for something on, um, you know, on the nexus criteria or something. They have a little bit of like pain in their um, mid midline cervical, but like the mechanism was so minor that I can't clear them, but uh, you know, I'm just going to get the x-ray and clear them that way rather than expose them to an entire CT scan. That's the, that's the time that I use it. Now, what are the downsides of the x-rays? The downsides, when I was a resident, we were getting x-rays of the C-spines all the time. And so we were pretty good at reading them. And they got done pretty well. And it's kind of tech dependent, too. Uh, has anyone ever ordered a, C, a cervical C-spine x-ray and then had to send them back because it wasn't adequate and then send them back again? Why does that happen? Especially on the lateral, you need to be able to see all the way down to the C7-T1 junction. And then you'll see people getting swimmers' views on those laterals to make sure that you are able to image that properly. And so if you get an inadequate film, say you're only able to see to C7 or to the top of C7, those are the cases that are missed. In some of the big San Diego trauma registries, the patients that, we, that were missed the most were patients who were either intoxicated or had inadequate films of their cervical spine. So if you're gonna use cervical spine x-rays, you have to make absolutely sure that the quality of the films are perfect. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. Um, Here's some images here. The better resolution is the CT, where you can see in the black and white image. The more blue, hueish image, you can see the uh, X-ray of the C-spine. So sort of an approach, if we're going to order the X-rays of the C-spine, we have to have an approach. Another time that you might be getting more X-rays is if it's a resource issue. Um, there, there are places where you have to ship people out to get CAT scans, and so this is, uh, that might necessitate getting plain films anyway. So the anterior contour line, which is in the front of the vertebra, then you have the posterior contour line at the back of the vertebra, and then finally you have that laminospinal line, which oftentimes you'll see misplaced. It's not the most posterior aspect of the spinous process, it's the most proximal aspect of the spinous process, and all of those um, lines should align pretty well. After you've aligned all of the bones, now, we got to uh, make sure all those views are appropriate. And so, like we were talking about having an adequate lateral. So you can see the lateral film here um, that extends all the way down to C7T1. You see the AP. What you want to see on the AP film, you're kind of looking at um, the owl's eyes. You want to see two eyes and sort of the spinous process right there in the middle. And then at the bottom there, you have the open mouth odontoid view. And we'll um, dive in a little bit more into the odontoid view in a couple slides. Another thing you have to be weary about when you're getting x-rays of the C-spine is the soft tissue anatomy. It's not enough to just look at the bones and the lines, but we also have to look at the soft tissue anatomy. Um, in adults, the, the, uh, sort of the, the mantra is at C2, you should only have six millimeters of um, prevertebral space apparent, and at C6, you can have up to 22 millimeters of um, prevertebral uh, space present. If it's more than that at C2 or it's more than that at C6, that is indicative of a ligamentous or soft tissue injury uh, that should prompt you to do more advanced imaging. The other thing that's men mentioned here is the atlantodens interval, five millimeters in peds and three millimeters in adults. Why in the world would that be? That peds have bo a bigger interval even though they're smaller people? Well, their bones aren't completely formed yet. And what the at atlantodens interval is, the um, atlas, is C1, and the axis is C2 that has the dens, so it's the space that you can see um, right in front on a lateral film. You can see um, right between C1 and C2, there should be a space of more than, uh, no more than three millimeters in adults and five millimeters in peds. Finally, the odontoid assessment that we were talking about. Basically, all, what you need in the odontoid view is pure symmetry. When you're looking at this, this is um, C2 and the dens coming up into C1. 
you can see that you want to have the lateral masses lined up perfectly, so you want to see perfect symmetry there, and then you want to see the spaces between C1 and C2 being symmetric, and then on the lateral aspect, you want to see where the dens is coming up, good symmetry on both sides. If you don't have good symmetry on either side, that is a concern and is concerning for uh, the need for, to uh, get further advanced imaging. Now, Say you, uh, you, say you uh, do a full neuro exam and you start to find some abnormalities, um, then that, of course, would, uh, you would want to get either a CT pl and plus minus an MRI, but we got to know how to do a good neuro exam of the cervical spine. So when we're doing this full neuro exam and neuro assessment, um, we want to make sure that we're checking for all the nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. So C5, the motor, we're going to go through the motor exam. C5 is the deltoid, C6, bicep. C7, tricep, C8, and T1 have to do with the fingers, so flexion of the fingers, and then finger abduction. That's all listed here really nicely in this chart. And then um, this, uh, the reflexes are denoted here. You guys remember C3, 4, 5, those are cervical plexus to keep the diaphragm alive. So if you have a severe um, C-spine injury, you can have diaphragmatic problems. S234 for fun, keeps the feces off the floor. We're not talking about the C-spine, but um, there is no real C8 reflex. But uh, if you're going to do reflexes of um, the cervical spine, basically the biceps are C5, C6, and the triceps are C7. And then there is no real uh, reflex for C8. And then finally, you have the sensory innervation here, um, which you can reference anytime just to make sure that you've done a good, adequate uh, uh, cervical spine sensory exam on your patients. How about whiplash, cervical strain or cervical sprain? These are patients that have neck pain and have potentially gone through the entire protocol. Say you've imaged them, you've gotten the CT, the CT is completely negative and they're still having pain in their neck, this is most likely whiplash. I'll give the caveat, if someone is having excruciating, excruciating pain where they can't move their neck whatsoever, or there's still residual neural deficits after you've done a CT and the CT is negative, I would pursue an MRI. But if you have somebody that has just basic pain, not something that's excruciating, um, you're going to be diagnosing them most likely with whiplash. And the question is, what do we do for these patients? You can send them home with a soft collar. I would let the patients know that the pain they're having today after the MVA is probably the best it's going to be in the next two, three days, unfortunately. In two or three days, the pain usually gets a lot worse. So it's a good idea to get them loaded on NSAIDs, like have them take NSAIDs around the clock for the next two, three days, unless there's a contraindication, to make sure that, and you can give them creams, um, CBD oil, whatever you, you know, whatever you want. Um, some of these, if they come back and they're in really, really bad pain or they're stuck in one position, sometimes a little bit of Valium also helps. But these patients can, uh, can, go, uh, can go home and with good follow-up. How about seatbelt signs of the neck? Is there any correlation between having ecchymosis around your neck and the need to further image? So we were talking about cervical spine bony injuries, which is why we get CTs of the C-spine. But what about vascular injuries? There's a whole body of literature evaluating whether or not somebody has blunt cerebrovascular injury, and are there any criteria or anything to help guide us about like, which patients need to, uh, need to get CTAs in these cases. Now, if you see this patient here on the bottom who has ecchymosis along the lateral neck and also has that red mark in front of their, uh, in front of their neck, which is the worst lesion? What lesion should concern you more? Not because of its color, but its location. Right here, this is where you have your voice box, this is your larynx. When you get these big anterior um, seatbelt signs, this, is, this tends to be more concerning. Now, when you look at um, the guidelines, have you guys ever heard of the East and West trauma guidelines? Well, the, the, they're great guidelines to look at if you ever have any questions about what to do in trauma in, in areas that have limited evidence. But in looking for blunt cerebrovascular injury, there's a set of criteria called the Denver criteria that outline all the reasons that you would need to get a CT angiogram in somebody with blunt cerebrovascular injury. And they're actually pretty explicit about the seatbelt sign, that unless the seatbelt sign in the neck is associated with significant swelling or neurologic deficits, that an, a seatbelt sign isolated in and of itself does not necessitate getting a CTA on every single patient that has this. 
So those are good guidelines to cite and look at if you're help, if to help you with your clinical decision making if you are going to um, avoid CTAing these. If the mechanism is really bad and you're seeing these seatbelt signs, nobody's ever going to fault you for getting a CTA, but there is at least a little bit of guidance from the... Uh, the folks in the East and West uh, trauma guidelines. Cervical rib syndrome, I'm not going to go through this in detail. We just talked about this in the shoulder, uh, shoulder talk. We did the thoracic outlet syndrome. We talked about the East sign and the Adson sign. So I'm going to skip ahead to cervical disc disease. This is something that you're going to be seeing quite a bit of in patients who have osteoporosis and come in talking about chronic neck pain that may start to slowly progress into muscle wasting and muscle weakness or nerve weakness. Um, in general, in the emergency department, these patients do not need to be MRI'd. But if you have somebody who's having rapidly progressive symptoms, or obviously bowel incontinence, bladder incontinence, or something concerning, that, or severe muscle weakness that has come on acutely, those patients I would MRI, otherwise uh, usually an outpatient referral with pain medications. Cervical stenosis pretty much falls under the same umbrella. This is a degenerative disease that tends to start pushing along the cervical spine. Um, uh, and oftentimes we'll need a referral to neurosurgery. Uh, but again, unless the symptoms are rapidly progressive or causing neurologic deficits, um, usually the MRI does not need to be done in the emergency department. Next up, we have cervical facet syndrome, which is an arthritic syndrome involving the facets. This can actually lead to a lot of cervicogenic type of headaches. So you might get a combination of headaches and neck pain from these cervical facet patients. If you get, and I'm sure everybody has had some of this, where you get somebody saying, oh, my pain is really back here, sort of in the neck, and it's going all the way up and around. Um, and I've tried Tylenol, I've tried Motrin, and it's not really working. Uh, one thing that, that can be helpful in the emergency department is doing these injections, cervical uh, facet injections. There's two general locations that you might be doing these. One is in, at the level of the occipital nerve, right down um, at the base of the um, occiput. You feel the grooves. You can do it by ultrasound guidance, identify where the occipital nerve is, inject about a cc of lidocaine. Some people use steroids in conjunction with that. And then that tends to cross down the fascial plane, and people can get pretty good relief. The other place where you could do it is around C6, C7. And you can look up videos on this. C6, C7, you can do um, lidocaine injections there. Larry Mellick, if any of you have seen any of his videos, he works over in Georgia. Um, he, has, he did a little study on this, uh, doing injections at the level of C, uh, C6, C7 level, and people had pretty good results. So you get these cervicogenic headache patients uh, that aren't just, get, just aren't getting relief in other ways. Uh, you, might, you might try an uh, injection in the emergency department. We do it in our shop. Um, tends to work, work pretty well for a lot of patients. Um, but Rick, Rick Pescatori, who has been up here today and I think is speaking tomorrow, um, does a lot of pain clinic work and uh, would have a lot more expertise in, in doing this if you have some questions for him. And then lastly, the stinger or the burner. This is the patient that comes to you on a Friday night, uh, high school football player, helmet still on, um, got hit and experience severe pain or numbness in one arm, that is a stinger. The way these usually present is um, somebody has like an axial load or something on their neck or some sort of traction, and then they get a transient uh, neurologic deficit in that arm, some numbness or motor weakness, and it tends to go away pretty quickly. However, if you get somebody who's coming in with bilateral symptoms, that is not just a stinger or a burner. Those, to me, um, require a little bit more uh, workup and uh, should probably get MRI'd. Patients with persistent symptoms, that could be a disc herniation. That should also be um, explored further. So very transient symptoms goes away. Um, you can observe for a while and make sure things are getting better. Um, no contact. Have them follow up with their PMDD to get cleared to go back to sports or whatever. Um, but they don't need emergent MRI. Bilateral symptoms or symptoms that have not gone away, um, I, would, I would have uh, a little bit more, I would be a bit more aggressive in uh, imaging. All right, and that concludes our segment on C-spines.